Okay, so welcome to the session today where we're going to hear about the latest on net zero investment product and practice development. So transitioning to a resilient net zero emissions economy by 2050 will require an unprecedented level of capital. And from the recent IGCC survey, Accelerating Change Capital Growth in Climate Solutions, found that investor appetite for climate aligned investments continues to grow and accelerate, and that's both in Australia and internationally and across all asset classes. And that's in spite of the political landscape in Australia in particular. But we all know it's not easy being green and doing deals on climate related investments is not easy. Also in the backdrop, uh, backdrop, we have the global trends towards more sustainable finance playing out both internationally, particularly in Europe and also in Australia and the local markets. And the push to integrate climate change into the investment mainstream continues. So today, this session is an opportunity to unpack these different approaches to mobilising capital and to understand the current and emerging areas and also the potential barriers. My name's Nicole Bradford, I work for CBUS, and I also chair the IGCC Transitioning to Net Zero Working Group. And today I'm delighted to introduce our speakers and hear the latest on net zero investment product and practices. We have a very diverse panel, which will make for an interesting discussion, and we'll also make time for audience questions as well. Now to introduce the speakers, we have Tom King, He's the Chief Investment Officer for Nanook Asset Management. And Tom joined Nanook on its inception in 2009, and he has significant expertise across a range of asset classes, including equity, funds management, and investment banking and private equity. And I have to mention that he also won an Olympic gold medal in sailing and has been awarded the medal, the Order of Australia. So I'm sure that you're hoping uh, extreme weather events don't uh, continue to increase. Uh, we also have Rory Lonegren. He's the investment funds lead and executive director. I'm sure many of you will know Rory already. He's also the corporate and project finance for the CEFC. And he works with a range of fund managers across multiple sectors. And he has more than 20 years of experience in funds management and across both listed and unlisted in Australia and overseas across all asset classes. And we have Cecilia Tarrant, delighted to welcome Cecilia from New Zealand. She's the chair of the New Zealand Green Investment Finance Limited. It's a company established by the New Zealand government to accelerate low emissions investments in New Zealand. And she's a professional company director with a background in international banking and finance, and she chairs a number of organisations. She's also active in the angel investing space and is chair of Archangels that supports uh, women-led companies. And last but not least, we have Sylvain Chateau, and welcome from France. Thank you for coming all this way. He's the co-founder and COO of Beyond Ratings, and he founded that in 2014 to better integrate the risk factors related to energy and climate change and other impact on investments. And previously, he was the CEO and main shareholder of a data company for research and consulting in the energy and carbon sectors. So definitely a lot of expertise in this area. So please welcome our panelists today and we'll get straight into it. Okay, so starting with key trends in transitioning to net zero, where are we seeing the most investor activity and where are the merging opportunities for investors? And Rory, I'm gonna start with you because the CEFC, it's been around for a while now, it's deployed over $7 billion worth of capital. So what does that current activity look like for you? Um, sorry, is this on? So in terms of the activity, for us, I mean, our business is essentially split uh, down the middle between the generation side and the supply side. So on the generation side, I think our CEO spoke here yesterday, so hopefully I'll be broadly consistent in what he said. Um, there is a, you know, there is definitely uh, the generation side is at, is at an interesting inflection point. So uh, there was a real run up in activity uh, uh, up to, 
sort of mid last year to building out the renewable energy target. So that sector has has slowed a little bit since since then, and I think it's uh, it's uh, it's reconfiguring or, or repositioning itself. I mean, it will continue to um, to, uh, to to move along, uh, driven by uh, things like uh, corporate PPAs, etc., declining cost curves, particularly in solar. Um, but that part of our business is now also uh, very much turning its focus to uh, the grid uh, and the required investment in the grid. Stability, we're looking at uh, a lot of storage, uh, batteries, you know, on a residential scale or on a utility scale, uh, in, as well as uh, pumped hydro. So uh, grid stability uh, in conjunction with additional generation, I think on the supply side will be... Uh, a continuing increasing focus uh, for the business. On the other side, on the demand side, um, it's quite interesting. The drivers are completely different on the uh, on the demand side. The supply side historically has been very much driven by, I suppose, sorry, in large part driven by government policy, but also cost curves. Whereas I think on the demand side, it has uh, it's interesting because I think it is much more immune to. Uh, to uh, federal policy or, or, or state policy. It's much more driven by uh, economics and I suppose sound business uh, decisions. And it's, it's being aided by the fact that um, cost curves uh, for technology, including generation solar technology, um, you know, continue to drop. So, so decisions or investments that weren't perhaps economic on the demand side, you know, three, four, five years ago, are now increasingly economic. So, so we're continuing to invest. Uh, as I say, half our business is basically focused on the demand side. So we continue to put money into into funds where we can find fund managers that are uh, aligned with the thematic of uh, you know uh, climate climate transition. It's quite interesting. We started probably with the property sector and the Australian uh, top end of property I think is world leading in its approach to energy efficiency but uh, we started there um, and uh, we you know continue to move across other sectors we've invested in um, in agriculture uh, we've invested uh, uh, we've now got I think three positions in infrastructure so infrastructure will be a continuing focus because uh, we were just commenting earlier as I said the property sector is well advanced but the infrastructure um, and Chris from IFM is here who does a wonderful job. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the broader infrastructure sector is perhaps 10, 10 or so years behind, so we, we're seeking to encourage those. We're also looking at uh, taking our steps into the listed space because historically we've been an unlisted house, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're interested. We're very aware that of all the super fund money that sits in the room, probably half it is invested in, in listed or liquid securities uh, and that's where the lion's share of the money goes. So we're interested in product development in that space and trying to develop new investable opportunities for super funds to deploy their money in spaces that they will naturally deploy it in, in any way. Okay, so Cecilia, listening to what Rory has to say and from looking from an Australian perspective, New Zealand's in a very enviable, enviable position. You have the right policy settings. So what trends are you seeing and hoping to capitalise on? And does anything that Rory says resonate with you from a New Zealand context? So tēnā koutou katoa. So it's, um, it's great to be here and hear what the Australian experience is. I know that you all sit here thinking, gosh, you know, New Zealand's doing fabulously. We've um, we are looking at having a net zero um, emissions goal by 2050. Our government seems committed to that, and our government is committed to that. Um, however, I think we have, our, um, we have our own challenges. We don't actually see um, things going as easily as they might look um, from the outside, particularly because the types of things that we need to do to lower our emissions are different right now from the rest of the world. 85% of our uh, energy actually comes currently from renewables. So where you see a lot of organisations around the world being able to, those like us that are green investment banks, being able to move into doing things for clean energy, that isn't an easy, um, easy win for us, and it's not something that we're looking to spend much time on. The major sectors that um, affect us from an emissions perspective are transport, the built environment, process energy, and the big one for us is agriculture. 
And I think that in New Zealand we have companies that have a real willingness, and I think there's a real willingness um, around the country for people to be tackling their lower their emissions. There's a you know people are starting to uh, really the companies are measuring their emissions. They're starting to look at the impacts of climate change. We don't yet have um, our stock exchange asking people to report on TCFD, but the fact that the Australian Stock Exchange has you know put that out has meant that our companies are starting to say, you know, it's likely that it will come to New Zealand. So there's a lot of sort of information and data capture going on. However, we haven't seen, I would say, a lot of moves in the direction of making those investments. And so that's really our purpose, is to catalyse that low emissions investment. And I certainly, um, you know, really uh, agree with what Rory said in terms of the grid because I think one of the issues that we're finding most is that uh, what's going to have to happen relative to our grid and our distribution if we want to electrify to the extent that we need to and who's going to pay for that. Because right now, we may have the policy settings, but we've still got, it's a commercial imperative, and we've got companies looking and saying, you know, can we afford to do this? And so that's really where New Zealand Green Investment Finance comes in to try and help accelerate that, to work with companies, to structure transactions, to find ways for, um, to put transactions together where that we can in attract investment into. We're a very, a very small, we have, you know, from a, um, spending perspective, we have a small amount of capital, we only have 100 million of capital. That's a good amount for us to use to leverage and so we're very much focused on crowding in private finance as one of our key objectives into the space. Oh, very good and moving to Tom, I'm glad you're sitting next to Rory because it's a match made in heaven with listed equities. Now you're a fundamental equity investor so could you give us uh, your views on what you're seeing in transition to net zero and how your fund is um, looking at these issues? I'll do my best. Um, there's sort of, I guess, two angles to look at this from, and the one is to look at it from an institutional investment perspective and then the other is from our perspective as a fund manager and the opportunity set. And certainly from the latter, we're seeing an enormous amount of opportunity within global equities um, in our area of focus, which um, broadly is the value chain of the technology solutions globally that will deliver net zero 2050 over time. And, and Rory's comments um, related to it, but we've seen an extraordinary period of transition over the last decade in the early stages of um, some of those solutions, particularly around um, uh, electricity generation, building energy efficiency, and more recently in the automotive space with vehicle electrification. But what what we see on a global basis is um, uh, what we're you know, calling a second wave uh, of sustainability that is just starting now that will very likely follow a very similar path to what we've seen in those areas that starts with the setting of long-term targets, which is happening at an accelerating rate around the world and will you know, shortly thereafter be followed with a series of policies to try and facilitate those things happening. And the, the scope of opportunities relating to that is enormous and the sort of embedded risks associated with those transitions within the companies that underpin global equities is also very material. Um, and yeah, there's been, you know, up until in our experience the last couple of years, a lot of scepticism about the scope of the opportunities that we're dealing with. I think that's now behind us and people are starting to realise how big that is. Um, uh, but there's still you know, some, you know, uh, well, I think understanding is immature around the extent of risks within global equities. And I guess that leads me to the other side of the equation, which is the institutional investment response. C clearly. Um, there's been a lot of attention focused over the last decade on the more tractable areas um, in infrastructure and in property and to a lesser degree perhaps in fixed income and, um, and bonds and as an equity manager we certainly feel like institutions are somewhat late to the party to deal with um, the issues within an institutional global equity allocation where the challenges are really material and particularly in relation to indexation and um, in relation to balancing investment 
you know, raw financial investment um, outcomes with, uh, with other objectives. Uh, and you know, they're, they're challenging issues um, for institutions today. So in terms of uh, who's driving it, are you driving it as a fund manager or are your clients driving the demand? Uh, interestingly, um, you know, within most of our business, which is actually advised retail clients, it's uh, underlying investor interest in these areas. Um, uh, and that um, you know, is supported by the fact that what we do tends to marry up well with other parts of people's portfolios. Um, but on the institutional side, I guess we're finding we're having to push mm. hard to get any traction at all. Um, and I suspect that that will change quite quickly as, you know, as, as policy developments happen more rapidly and people's understanding of the consequences of that shift. OK, so Tom touched on the international uh, side of things. So, Sylvain, handing over to yourself, what are your thoughts on the trends? And is what you've heard about what's happening in Australia and the listed equity space, does that resonate with you from an international perspective and for index solutions? Yeah, thank you. So, um, um, I think it's a, it's a, we are at a very interesting moment. Um, when we started, when I started my company five years ago, um, people would say when we were meeting with them, saying about, you know, climate risk, you know, how to integrate them into portfolio assessment, risk assessment, they were looking at us like, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And, and that's it. And five years down the road, I think every investor understands that it is a material risk. So I think the behavior uh, and the, the approach to it has really changed dramatically. And I think that's a very good news. So Avion Rating as a service provider, like a new ESG data and research provider, um, we've been helping asset owners and asset managers in France where we started and then in, now in Europe and expanding. Um, obviously being acquired by FTSE Russell it gives us some more exposure. Um, but what we see on the market is that um, the level of information and knowledge about this matter is, has increased a lot. Um, more and more uh, investors want to understand how their portfolios, uh, both equity or fixed income, are exposed to these kinds of uh, global risks. Um, of course, climate change, and you know, we've discussed that a lot, but energy transition is of course one of them. Um, and also, and I think at the moment, this is where the most interest lies because it is very material. And it's, um, we can really correlate um, this risk with financial impact. So that's a very interesting um, uh, way to, to interact with our clients. So in terms of you know, what are the products available today, um, maybe an anticipated bit, but um, maybe one of the, the consequences of being acquired by a, an index provider is that we launched a, a climate version of the Sovereign Bond Index, it's a week B for those who know it. Um, and the interesting thing is that it's not a two degree aligned uh, product, um, but it's a, a climate more friendly version of a product, which in a way uh, answers a, a growing need for clients to have new benchmarks that are looking at these climate issues. Um, the, we, we had a lot of discussions where clients were saying, um, we are trying hard to get our portfolios more aligned with a two degree um, investment strategy, but we use this benchmark that is not climate aligned. So we, we, there's a kind of misalignment in terms of the, you know, the narrative of the, of the investment strategy and, and the performance you have compared to the benchmark that is not adapted to your storyline. So this is typically you know, how we are, I think, changing the, the, the market structure. Um, and of course, there's, there's been a lot of uh, low carbon um, equity indexes on the market. Um, I think the big question is, are they really two degree aligned? Um, and how, how can we really characterize that? But I think it's another of your questions. And more recently, we are really active in the fixed income space. Um, for, and there's one big reason for that. As first one is the sovereign bonds, the, um, is the elephant in the room. Uh, and you know, the government bonds are actually the ones that are um, probably will be um, the more important to actually finance the transition towards a two degree aligned economy. 
Um, so it's, for us, it's a very important move forward to have new um, products in the fixed income space. Mm. And I think we're seeing a lot of that come out of Europe and particularly regulation as well. And how do you align to the potential regulations that are coming out on benchmark? Is it synergistic or how do you think about that? Well, um, as I said, the timing is good. You know, you, we had this action plan from the hash leg in, uh, mm. from the European Commission. So one of the key um, recommendation is about benchmarks. Mm. Uh, another one is about standards. Uh, another one about the green taxonomy. I think the industry is desperate to find really converging standards so that, you know, um, all the investors that are still in a wait and see attitude because they are not willing, of course, to commit in a direction where probably won't be the, the uh, eventually the good standard. I think it's really important that we are converging today on standards because it will really increase the level of commitment of a massive number of investors. Mm, and I think convergence is a big topic for all of us moving forward. So just to shift a gear, moving into the barriers now, both Rory, both yourself and Cecilia mentioned the grid issues and overcoming those. What other barriers are you seeing in the market in Australia? And how do you think they can be overcome? You have a room full of investors here. So <laughs> be interesting to hear your thoughts in different asset classes or sectors and uh, what you see are the key touch points for us moving forward. Yeah, so I suppose in terms, in terms of the barriers, um, if we, maybe we distinguish between the unlisted assets and the mm. listed assets. So I, I think on the unlisted assets side, uh, one of the key barriers still, um, although I think it's changing, is the perception that, um, it, that reducing emissions, going to net zero, is going to be cost prohibitive or it's going to be, it's going to be drag on the IRR. So if you look at the, uh, the infrastructure sector in particular, uh, it is still the primary metric for whether you make the investment or not, I think is, you know, what's the IRR, right? So um, I think uh, continued progress on uh, hopefully debunking the myth that it's going to be uh, a drag on your yield, a drag on your IRR. Um, and I think that's, um, might sound strange to say, but it's it's as much a, an education issue, I think, with with, uh, with fund managers, with, with asset managers, and again, and I, I hate to keep going back to the top end of property, and not just because they call it some <laughs> Um but there's much greater awareness, uh, I think, that, that that is not the case, um, and that particularly with these uh, uh, real assets, uh, often if you, you know, if you design them from the start in the correct way, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's positive. So yeah, so so the impact on, on IRR I think is, is still very important, and that's across many uh, many of the real asset classes. Property, agriculture, I think, is another one where where that perception uh, st still abounds. Um, and then on on the on the listed space, and I suppose across all the investment universe, I think in the Australian context, um, but certainly in the listed space, I suspect we are behind uh, our European. Uh, colleagues in terms of the availability of product, right? So and when I talk about product, um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we are interested in developing product where it's not just a negative screen. So I, I think everybody's now trying to move past, hopefully, where you have your filter, which basically says, I, just, I exclude these types of assets because they are clearly bad. We are interested in ones that send a positive signal to the market that uh, you need to not just exclude things, you need to take positive, you need to take positive action, right? And uh, we're interested in sort of how, how do you do that in the listed context through active strategies, through passive strategies, and through you know, so-called active-passive strategies, and how can you design products? So I think, I think lack of product across both listed and unlisted, I think, is still a little bit of a, a, a problem. Now, just uh, elaborating on a couple of points that yourself, Rory, and Sylvain made. Uh, Sylvain, you talked about uh, defining and the, the taxonomy in the EU, and Rory talked about sending positive signals. So, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, how we think about and define net zero emissions, I'll just ask uh, Cecilia first. 
Just in terms of how important is it for New Zealand GIF to define net zero emissions, is that something that you're looking at or do you have a more broader remit than that? Well, our remit is to accelerate low emissions investment. So um, we're not so concerned about what, what exactly does that mean coming to net, to net zero emissions. We are just, uh, we recognise it's a, it's a big nut to crack and we have to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can, to, um, to help people to move to um, lowering emissions. We also recognise that this is going to be a long journey, and so that we're going to be in this for the long term. But I think I'm, you know, we're very much, uh, when we do a transaction, we will be looking at what does that do in terms of lowering emissions. And I think that just picking up at a point that Rory made about the fear um, or the concern about the cost of, um, of that sort of transition, I think in our market there is very much a, an information gap and we are, it's one of sort of our key roles is to try and fill that information gap and help people see both the, um, the emitters who need to take action, how they can do transactions and how their transactions can be funded and in a way that, um, that does not have, um, or even if it has a, uh, perhaps a short-term negative impact on their profitability, that actually in the long term this is something that they, they need to move towards. And then on the other side, creating transactions and structuring transactions that investors can see and come and invest in. I mean, I think one of the uh, challenges for us is that you know, our market isn't large, that the transactions we're seeing right now are not large, and that in order to crowd in sort of private finance, we're going to be able, we're going to have to aggregate transactions and try and structure larger transactions, particularly when we look in bringing our financing from overseas. Mm. And Sylvain, speaking of overseas, how important is it going to be for defining net zero and international investors to have those types of that yeah. clarity and that convergence? So I'd like to start with, uh, I had a client uh, like three years ago coming to me say, well, we just promoted uh, in the press that we, we would only finance a project that would be two degree aligned. And he said, yeah, now you have to help me because we don't know what it means. <laughs> like, yeah, right. So, and then it's really hard to actually understand what it means. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, on, in my company to translate what is a two degree scenario, which remains a global objective uh, into a national carbon allocation. Um, and actually, it's not an easy one because uh, the last 20 years of international negotiations have failed principally because uh, countries or negotiators don't agree on the right metrics um, to, to estimate the, the fair contribution of a country. And you could argue that depending on where they are in their uh, economic development, um, they don't have the same angle. So basically there are around 15 variables that are used by uh, negotiators, more or less, um, to, for these 200 countries. So we actually um, managed to build a model where we took these 15 variables, we, we weighted them in all different possibilities. We did two million simulations per country and this helped us have this kind of distribution of different allocations and finally uh, define what could be a fair contribution per country. So in a way, we managed to get a, like, um, a point, a data point on what could be a net zero emission for, for a given country, which is a, a very interesting uh, KPI when you want to help investors understand where they are in terms of uh, portfolio temperature, if you, if you translate that into a temperature rise. So let's say um, a client has a 3.5 um, degree uh, temperature in this portfolio, and if he wants to be aligned with a two degree, so then he understands what it means to reshift or reallocate the, the weightings of his portfolio. So it's not about just excluding, especially when it comes to sovereign bonds uh, portfolios. You want exclude the US basically, you, you know, especially when we're talking about a, a benchmark. You know, of course you will uh, have the US in your benchmark. The question is, 
can you reweight the, 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 the share of the U.S.? And I think it's really about uh, you know, giving a new, um, a, a new angle of what, which among all these countries, which are the ones that are on a good trajectory, on a good uh, pattern, which are the ones that have a distance to target, that get worse every year. And that's what we monitor in my company. N now, not only on the national level, but we do it on a sector level, which is a, a very uh, good way to then connect with the corporate world. So it gives a very uh, interesting proxies to see what you could expect from, I don't know, uh, the mine extraction sector in terms of uh, where they need, what kind of effort they need to do to actually reach a two degree target. But it's sometimes, sometimes it's a bit scary when you look at the right figures. I'm sure, particularly think, if you look for Australia. I, I think one, one of the challenges as well is that I think there has to be a recognition that, you know, uh, we've made a lot of progress if you take a positive view, but we are also, you know, in, in many sectors at the start of the journey. So a lot of the, a lot of the tools, a lot of the, the indices and some of the, those measurement techniques that you talked about are only just starting, right? So. If, uh, Institutional financial investors are, by their nature, very conservative, right? So they they will typically ask you for some evidence. You know, can you back test that, right? And you go, well, I can't really. It's just this new methodology has just been invented, particularly if it's if it's forward looking on ad, on adaptation. Um, so I think we will probably go through a little bit of a transitional phase where some of these new methodologies, benchmarking systems, measurement systems will go through their process and you know within sort of hopefully within five years we will have some evidence that you know that these new indices are actually driving change so but I, I think one point I, I would like to make is that um, we found that uh, doing transactions with leaders in a sector probably has the biggest impact so if you get the leaders in any sector on board then your chances of driving systemic change through that sector are greatly improved. <coughs> That's an interesting point now, Tom. Uh, I feel like I could debate a, perhaps a higher level comment. In one, in one sense, I think the um, net zero 250 is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it's very clear that developed countries around the world are going to have to get to net zero across all of their industries or be sequestering carbon. Um, by 2050, um, and it's very well known where those emissions come from and where the other major environmental issues are being sourced from. And you know, what does 2050 look like? It looks like all of those problems being addressed, um, and the detail of you know what that means at an industry-specific level is something that has been extremely well researched around the world and is now starting to be compiled in a uh, digestible form as part of setting proper 2050 targets and policy um, frameworks. But I, I don't think it is particularly complicated to start assessing where risks lie around getting to 2050. Um, and that can be done. And it, it, it's not to say it's not um, a difficult thing to do. There's a difference between simple and complicated and easy and difficult. Um, and, and Rory, to your point, um, there's some big challenges around thinking about um, you know, the role of active and passive in some of these things because, you know, cl clearly the risks, particularly in the listed equity space, are, are very significant if left to passive strategies with traditional benchmarks. And Tom, picking up on a point that Rory made on measurement, you mentioned that a lot of your clients are retail and uh, getting into the, the institutional space will move forward in the next couple of years. Do you see the the importance of developing the metrics for reporting. Uh, do you see that evolving over time and becoming more important for your organisations and active fund managers over time to be able to disclose and have frameworks like the, uh, the taxonomy in place or disclosure requirements? Uh, I think it's very important. I think it's happening. Um, I think there are a number of those frameworks that have been developed or are being developed at the moment and it's going to become accepted practice that you report against them. Um, that's not to say that we'll necessarily invest entirely in, in line with those um, because that may not be where we see the opportunities to profit from these kind of changes and um, I mean, that goes back to some of the sort of institutional challenges around what is it you're trying to achieve in your investments. Is it 
um, protecting capital and generating good returns over time um, as the world changes or is it reallocating your members' money into particular types of assets for other reasons? No, I just think I'll hand over to the audience for a moment. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask the panellists while we've got them their attention? I see one over there. Um, hi, this is a question for Tom Melinda White from IFM Investors. Um, I think what you're effectively saying is that active managers uh, curate the index rather than uh, just participate in the index. Um, and one of the core parts of getting to net zero in 2050 is that it's a sort of heavy manufacturing, heavy technology type solution. It's very focused on engineering solutions, um, which generally come with higher risks attached in the listed equity space. I'm just interested in what your view is on how, in, how your institutional investors that you might be pitching to at the moment, how they receive that kind of message, which is, you know, in order to take this risk, we probably have to have a higher return. But if we lowered the return hurdle, potentially we could throw some more money at the solutions. If you had a different view about, you know, what, why it's important to be making this investment. You've, ra I mean, you've raised several interesting points there. I, I, I don't see my role as curating indexes. Um, you know, we're trying to generate good returns from a very dynamic opportunity set that we think is going to persist for a couple of um, decades. Um, I don't necessarily believe that investing um, in the areas that are contributing to net 2050 necessarily has to be riskier, and I mean, it's a conversation that can be taken offline, but there are a lot of opportunities that are very high risk, um, but there's an enormous amount that aren't. There's a full spread of sort of opportunities and financial profiles. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I think the big issue is that the big risk is not allocating towards these areas, that the embedded risks across a typical you know, global or Australian listed portfolio are extremely significant and cover well over half of you know, traditional holdings and traditional passive benchmarks. Um, and if you do nothing, the you know, very high likelihood is that um, uh, the performance that you might expect based on you know, the economics of um, the companies making up those indexes over the last few decades will not persist going forward and the outcomes will be substantially worse. Um, and that's something we've spent a lot of time recently trying to um, analyse and quantify in a way that is meaningful to institutions to be able to sit down and say, this is the argument, not in a you know, theoretical qualitative sense, this is the quantitative argument for why you should be shifting away from a traditional benchmark and allocating into areas that are far less likely to be negatively affected. Um, and I mean, the final comment would be, and this is, runs a bit contrary to what Rory said about infrastructure before, um, our experience of the first phase of, sort of sustainable development globally is that growth in these areas doesn't necessarily translate to better investment returns. In fact, the evidence would, um, in many cases, point the opposite way that you're dealing with um, uh, commoditised applied industrial technologies, which are generally pretty ordinary places to invest and do come with a set of risks. Um, and you know, our perspective is that that. Um, you know, creates an even greater impetus for careful active management to, to play a role. Did anyone else want to respond to that? I think um, just one comment in, in the listed space. I, um, you know, I think what we, we are keen to see is uh, list, listed can sort of go a couple of ways, right? It can go, I will only invest in what is already a low carbon stock and you can you know you can today construct a portfolio that is lower carbon relative to the rest of the market so I suppose we would we would challenge the listed space and the index the participants the index providers etc to to basically I suppose cause a positive response inside the corporates uh, so that you, you take on the challenge of um, how do I get the 
the, the, I'll call them the non-lower carbon stocks to change to change their business model so that they start to align more closely to a, a, a net zero. Um, so you know, rather than you know, it is it is relatively easy to to say, well, I will just invest in low carbon stocks. And typically, what you'll end up with in the Australian market, the ESX context, you'll have a whole bunch of banks uh, in in your portfolio. That's right. And uh, yes, it is challenging the Australian market, which I think that uh, most asset owners and ac uh, active equity investors are very aware of. So are there other questions out there? Yes? Uh, this is a, obviously a financial uh, forum, and, and so this is maybe a slightly off the wall question, but I'm interested in the New Zealand experience of uh, aligning your economy to global well-being rather than GDP. And does that necessarily mean, if you lived in a country like New Zealand where global well-being or an index of well-being becomes the, the target, then does that necessarily fly in the face of conventional economic wisdom or is there a way of marrying that with the kind of e economic indices and indicators that most of the room would be more interested in? Well, I think that you are making an assumption by saying that, that capitalism is bad for people. And so that, um, and for companies to be profitable is um, is bad um, is bad for communities. And I think that that um, that I would challenge that assumption. I think that we would say that our economy and economies around the world have to be strong in order to um, keep up a certain standard of living and provide benefits to people. So I don't believe that there is a um, that there is a mismatch there. That quite answers your question or not? No, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested because that, that is a stated goal of uh, just in the uh, Arnold. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Al, um, we have um, in the last budget, the government put out what they call the well-being budget, um, and they where they were trying to actually track um, in the same way that you have other countries like I think Bhutan has the happiness index. You know, so which is rather more extreme than what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, you know, actually, are we investing in a way that is improving things um, for our people? And um, I would say to you that if our economy is strong and our companies are profitable, then they're able to provide jobs to our people, which then um, helps them in their standard of living. So I don't see a, I don't know that, um, it was one of the criticisms of the government of the budget was that actually it looked very much like a budget that somebody who wasn't doing a well bu well-being budget would have put out in terms of where they were spending the money. So it was, you know, health, education, that sort of thing. So I, I don't think, um, I think that it's actually something we all should be aiming at, is thinking about the well-being of our people. And certainly, you know, we're all talking about climate change and that ultimately is about what is the climate, what is the planet that we have for our future generations to live in. And I think that's a really good point, Cecilia, because what we haven't brought into the discussion is the social component. Tom, you want to reflect on that? And I know Chris has a question after that. I was just going to say, I mean, from my perspective, we've seen some extraordinary things happen over the last decade, looking outside of Australia at applied sustainable technology. And um, I feel quite optimistic about the capacity of the global economy to adapt to net 2050. Um, and to you know, achieve objectives that haven't you know, traditionally been the economic objectives at a country level. Um, but what has worked well and what likely is required is very good policy frameworks within which our capitalist economy can operate effectively. I mean, if you, if you set the right guidelines, you know, capitalism is extraordinarily efficient at achieving that. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a huge sort of imperative at the moment that um, the 2050 targets are adopted and translated into, um, you know, as efficient as possible but simplistic frameworks within which business can be left to, you know, redirect its efforts to achieving what it's told to needs to be achieved. Chris. Is it on now? Okay. Uh, Chris Newton from IFM Investors. I now I've got two questions, but maybe one, Nicole, you might ask after it's about the social implications mm. of a net zero economy, which is where you're heading. What, my other question, which is a bit more simplistic, 
I guess, what, and to the whole panel or whoever, what would you say to peop many people or commentators out there that say, well, net zero, we'll just buy a bunch of offsets and we're all fine. So we'll keep doing what we're doing and we'll go and plant some trees. I just wanted to know if you, know, you had a view on that and around how offsets would work in a fund, whether you had a firm position and any response to that pretty simplistic argument that's often put out there in the media and so on. Uh, yeah, well, actually, um, we, um, we, went to the, uh, we went to COP in uh, December last year, and uh, there was an investment COP, and I asked uh, a gentleman from Norway what they were going to do, because obviously they rely heavily on North, North Sea oil. And he said, um, we can afford to buy credits, and that's what we'll do. But my view of it is that you know, somebody has to generate those credits, and you know, if we all sit around saying we'll buy credits, there aren't enough credits in the world to go around, and that actually doesn't stop planet getting, um, doesn't stop climate change. So um, I, I have a view that that isn't going to work, and I certainly don't think that New Zealand can afford to do that. I could just add a compliment on that. Um, depend on the on the angle you take, actually. If it's just from a, an investor standpoint. Of course, you can offset your portfolio with uh, new trees uh, somewhere. Um, if you try to be consistent at global level, which is just coming back to the point of you know what what does it really mean? Um, when you have an investor saying, "Yeah, I will withdraw from all coal financing," fine. So he's, he's doing the job, you know. So on 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 his balance sheet, is is going to look good. But then there's a, still another investor that would be willing to get this uh, investment because it's a high return type of investment and is not caring too much about the environment still. So for me, you have to, to, to understand globally what it means and are we actually uh, progressing or not. Um, and it, for me, it's not, it's not so easy. Um, and, and I think we need a lot of metrics to actually understand uh, when you compile and I'm very not uh, comfortable with the bottom-up approach of uh, this kind of, you know, assessment because um, for me it's really a top-down approach in the first place uh, where you need to, to be sure that it remains consistent globally. And so, yeah, it depends on the angle again. And just uh, there's one more question which I can't see. My apologies. Look, ah, there we go. Hi. Uh, this is Frank from 427. I'm just following up on this gentleman's question in the front here. Um, I think it's probably more productive to think about the interdependence between societal well-being and happiness and economic outcomes than uh, to try and differentiate the two. And I'll just point out one statistic that, that illustrates that. Uh, health and human welfare research shows that for every one degree increase in temperature, we lose three minutes of productivity a day. And that doesn't sound like very much, but when you uh, multiply that across the size of the workforce of a country like New Zealand, Australia, the US, that really amounts to a significant drag on GDP. Uh, and we can't forget that economic outcomes that companies are driven by the efforts of individuals, right? Be they working in fields or working in offices, producing budgets and whatnot. So I would really just encourage the audience to look at those two factors interdependently and not as counterpoints to each other. And we all know the social components are intrinsically linked in this discussion. Um, it's a shame we don't have more time to unpack that, but uh, I believe we all recognise it. But again, it's a challenge of how we do that. Rory, did you want to make one last comment? Just We're just about to just finish, but please make Precious. a comment and then we uh, can wrap up. So I think as an investor, uh, you know, if somebody told us, you know, we'll make this investment, don't worry, we'll make it net zero, we'll just buy offsets. Um, we, we sort of accept that, you know, there may be some need for some offsets as a transition step, but, um, you know, there's a lot of very large super funds in the room, so I, I must say I, I would be very surprised if, if, if long term, you know, uh, investors were on board with the idea that you can just offset and it's, and, and, and it's okay. So. Uh, so I question whether offsetting will just be a transitional uh, phase and that investors will say, no, I, I want a genuine solution to this uh, over time. 
Yes, and I think it's about uh, it's about a step change as well, but uh, perhaps we don't have time for uh, for that. But I think that uh, we should all hold on to Tom's view that we will get to net zero by 2050. And with please, some, with some sequestration, with some sequestration. <laughs> and uh, so, please thank the panel today. They've done a wonderful job. It's great to hear a diversity of views. Thank you.